It's been said that the Holy Land is a great teacher, and pilgrimages are a profound experience that allow the faithful to grow closer to our Savior, Jesus Christ. St. Augustine reminds us that Christ does not stand at a distance. Rather, he waits for us and even takes the initiative by coming to meet us on the road. Over the next hour, we'll take you to the very roads that Jesus walked. We'll visit the ancient cities and towns where the great prophets foretold his coming as the Messiah. From his birthplace in Bethlehem to his death on Calvary. We'll take you to the churches that celebrate the miracles and milestones of the life of Jesus and his ministry while honoring the Blessed Mother, the Apostles, and the Saints of the Holy Land. This visual pilgrimage to the land of the Bible will inspire and encourage you in your faith as you journey with us through the life of Christ. St. John Paul II once said, it's absolutely essential that we focus on the Jewishness of Jesus and the Jewish roots of Christianity because he said, Jesus is not a meteorite who falls out of the clear blue sky. The incarnation was the fruit of a whole long process of preparation on God's part that took place from the very beginnings of humanity with our first ancestors, Adam and Eve, all the way through the whole history of the Jewish people the patriarchs, the prophets, all the great people of the Old Testament who are the ancestors of Jesus. Just outside the towering walls of the old city in Jerusalem is an excavation of an ancient site known as the City of David, the King's Valley. Not to be confused with Bethlehem, this city of David features underground tunnels through which the city was conquered and residents fled. Pilgrims can walk in illuminated darkness through the water of Hezekiah's tunnel, where water has flowed since the time of the prophets. It is said that many kings were coronated here. Most fascinating, this site is said to mark the location of the historical meeting between Abraham and King Melchizedek when he brought gifts of bread and wine, a foreshadowing of the Eucharistic feast. atop the Mount of Olives, pilgrims travel underground to visit the Tomb of the Prophets to recall those who foretold the Savior's coming. Specifically, it is said to contain the burial sites of Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. The site offers a spectacular view of the most ancient and important cemetery in Jerusalem. Dating back to the first temple period, tens of thousands of Jews have chosen this hill as their resting place. For the Jewish people, it is considered a prime burial location as they believe the resurrection of the dead will begin here when the Messiah appears. The greatest prophet who ever lived is, of course, St. John the Baptist. Built over the Byzantine sanctuary, which marks the traditional place of his birth, the church is adorned with original Spanish paintings and frescoes. The outside courtyard is filled with 23 tile plaques with inscriptions of the Benedictus, Zachariah's hymn of praise to God, translated into about 75 different languages. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people, and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David.
as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from old, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to perform the mercy promised to our fathers, and to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he swore to our father Abraham, to grant us that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear, in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people in the forgiveness of their sins, through the tender mercy of our God. When the day shall dawn upon us from on high, to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. Luke 1, verses 68 through 80. According to one Jewish tradition, the Church of St. Anne in Jerusalem is built over the home of Jesus' grandparents, Joachim and Anne, and the birthplace of the Virgin Mary. The church is made of stone, and the area around the sanctuary has a magnificent acoustic, so individuals and church choirs from around the world can sing hymns as they pray that... The Church of the Annunciation in Nazareth is one of the most ancient sites in the Holy Land. It is also one of the newest churches built in the 1960s. Its towering cupola is in the shape of an inverted lily, honoring Mary's purity, while inside its petals open to reveal the shrine below. Along the outside courtyard and walls of the basilica hang dozens of works depicting Mary as Mother of God. There's a beautiful mosaic hanging behind the altar of the Church of the Annunciation which shows Jesus sending out the apostles and then the history of the church down through the centuries. The lower level of the church enshrines a sunken grotto that contains the traditional cave home of the Virgin Mary. Inside the cave stands an altar with the Latin inscription, Hic caro factum est. Here the word was made flesh. Karim is also the home to one of the most beautiful gospel sites in all of the Holy Land, the Church of the Visitation. Believed to be the site of Zechariah and Elizabeth's summer dwelling, Scripture tells us that Mary came here to visit her cousin while she was pregnant with Jesus. Mary's Canticle of Praise, the Magnificat, is translated into some 50 languages and seen on ceramic plaques adorning the outside of the church. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has regarded the lowest state of his handmaiden. For behold, henceforth all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is on those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He has put down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of low degree. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent empty away. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his posterity forever. Luke chapter 1 verses 46 to 55.
The lower chapel takes us through the passage that leads to an old well. An ancient tradition asserts that a spring joyfully burst out of the rock here when Mary greeted Elizabeth. Set in one of the walls of the church is the Stone of Hiding. Tradition tells us that during Herod's massacre of the innocents, a stone opened to provide a hiding place for the baby John. An estimated 100,000 pilgrims enter through the tiny doorway of the Church of the Nativity in Bethlehem each month. The door was lowered to 1.2 meters around the year 1500 to stop looters from vandalizing the sacred site, which was built over the cave venerated as the birthplace of Christ. This, the oldest complete church in the Christian world, was built by Emperor Justinian in the 6th century, but originally constructed by Constantine the Great in 339. A trap door in the floor allows a glimpse of the mosaic floor from that time. The church has no pews and is rather dark and cool. Icons and lamps adorn the Greek Orthodox sanctuary, with Armenian Orthodox and Roman Catholic places of worship close by. Beneath the church is the Blessed Grotto of the Nativity, where a silver star marks the traditional place where Jesus was born. The points of the star represent the 14 generations of Christ, starting with Abraham. Just a few feet away is the Grotto of the Manger, also known as the Crib, where Mary laid Jesus after he was born. The Nativity of our Lord Jesus Christ from the Roman Martyrology the 25th day of December, when ages beyond number had run their course from the creation of the world, when God in the beginning created heaven and earth and formed man in his own likeness, when century upon century had passed since the Almighty set his bow in the clouds after the great flood as a sign of covenant and peace. In the 21st century since Abraham our father in faith came out of Ur of the Chaldees, in the 13th century since the people of Israel were led by Moses in the exodus from Egypt. Around the thousandth year since David was anointed king. In the 65th week of the prophecy of Daniel. In the 194th Olympiad. In the year 752 since the foundation of the city of Rome. In the 42nd year of the reign of Caesar Octavian Augustus, the whole world being at peace. Jesus Christ, eternal God and Son of the Eternal Father, desiring to consecrate the world by His most loving presence, was conceived by the Holy Spirit, and when nine months had passed since His conception, was born of the Virgin Mary in Bethlehem of Judah, and was made man. The Nativity of our Lord Jesus Christ according to the flesh. Adjacent to the Church of the Nativity is the Church of St. Catherine, said to be built on the site of Christ's appearance to St. Catherine of Alexandria and his prediction of her martyrdom. Stairs lead to more caves and rock cuttings underneath the Church of the Nativity, the Chapel of St. Joseph. It was here that the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and told him to take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt. Close by is the chapel and tomb of the Holy Innocents, the burial place of the infants killed by King Herod in his attempt to eliminate the newborn King of the Jews. But the Church of St. Catherine is most widely known as the entrance to St. Jerome's Cave, the place where he spent some 30 years translating the Bible from Hebrew and Greek into Latin, or the Vulgate, which became the authoritative version for centuries after.
Not far away in Bethlehem, pilgrims can visit the shepherd's fields, where the news of the Messiah's birth was first announced. Shepherds during the times of the Bible were often a despised people, yet some of the greatest figures in Scripture are shepherds. Abraham, Moses, and David were all shepherds and drew from their experiences of tending flock to lead God's chosen people. God also used the image of the shepherd and the sheep to communicate his love in a way that they would understand. And most significantly, the Word of God reveals Jesus of Nazareth as the Good Shepherd, showing the Savior as both a humble servant and also a leader. This image of a shepherd would have special meaning and understanding to many during this time, but especially for those on the fringes of society, who were desperate for the hope found in his message of good news. Not far from the Church of the Nativity is the Milk Grotto. A Holy Land tradition tells the story of how Mary and Joseph, while fleeing to Egypt on account of Herod's soldiers, stopped at a cave so that Mary could nurse the baby Jesus. The grotto, which dates back to the year 385, is now a church and has been the site of veneration since around the 4th century. It is said that while she was nursing the Savior, a drop of milk spilt on the ground and turned the stone white. The entire grotto is hollowed out of this white stone and often frequented by women who are trying to conceive or having trouble nursing. The milk grotto is adorned with framed images and letters testifying to the power of this devotion. Other testimonies include miraculous healings and other favors. Six weeks after the birth of Jesus, the Holy Family journeyed from Bethlehem to Jerusalem for the ceremony of the presentation. Excavations on the south side of the Temple Mount have revealed the very steps they would have ascended to gain entrance to the Temple. Later, as a 12-year-old boy, he would walk these same steps on his own before Mary and Joseph found him in the Temple and again during his ministry as an adult. The steps, noticeably uneven, were carved that way in order to get people to slow down as they came to worship. A wider view of the southwest walls reveal amazing structures including Robinson's Arch, which once supported a wide staircase leading to the Temple Mount. Also on Earth was a building with shops, ritual baths, and a paved street with evidence of the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. Although scripture does not tell us about the life of Jesus between the age of 13 and 30, it does refer to Christ as the carpenter's son in Matthew 13, verse 55. There is little doubt that the Son of God learned his craft and much wisdom from this holy and chaste man. The Church of St. Joseph in Nazareth is believed to have been built over the home of the Holy Family and the carpentry shop of Jesus' foster father, Joseph. The church has a number of gorgeous stained glass depictions and paintings, including the death of Joseph in the arms of Jesus and Mary. Beside the Church of the Annunciation in Nazareth is an excavated home and village from the time of Christ, the kind that Jesus would have grown up in.
Just a few minutes' walk from the Basilica of the Annunciation is the Synagogue Church in Nazareth. Tradition holds it was built above the original location of the Roman period synagogue where Jesus first learned, prayed, and later preached as a young man. The church is a small and simple single hall structure, but the sense of history fills the room with holiness. The actual place where Christ was baptized by John is uncertain. We know from the Bible that it was indeed the River Jordan. This site on the Israeli-Jordanian border hosts a number of points of interest. The traditional site of the crossing of the Jordan by the Israelites, the departure of Elijah on a chariot of fire, the pilgrimage site of John's baptism of Jesus, and an outdoor chapel where Mass is celebrated. On the Jordan side of the river, one can see the towering Greek Orthodox Church and the Jordanian Mountains where Moses remained to die before the crossing of the returning Israelites to the Holy Land. Matthew 4 verse 15 quotes this ancient prophecy from Isaiah which promises that joy, a broken rod of oppression, a child called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace will come to the Sea of Galilee. Some 700 years later, Jesus began his ministry here. In the New Testament, the Sea of Galilee had two other names, the Lake of Gennesaret, Luke 5, verse 1, the Sea of Tiberias, John 6, 1. In the Old Testament, it was called the Sea of Kenneret, Joshua 12, verse 3. Jesus called many of his apostles on its shores, who left their fishing nets to follow him. Later, those same apostles would witness him walking on Galilee's water and raise his hands to calm the sea. After he rose from the dead, he returned to its shores again, where he would cook and eat breakfast with his astonished disciples. Pilgrims can walk these shores as well, meditate on the scriptures as they take a boat ride on Galilee, and even see a boat from Jesus' time discovered in 1986. Overlooking the Sea of Galilee is the Mount of Beatitudes, where Jesus gave this most famous discourse. The beautiful slopes of the Mount would have provided plenty of space for the multitudes to listen to Jesus preach. The Church of the Beatitudes has a total of eight sides, representing the eight Beatitudes, while markers along the pathway give pilgrims a chance to stop and reflect on these passages. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when men revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so men persecuted the prophets who were before you. Matthew chapter 5 verses 1 to 12.
The church is surrounded by lush and quiet gardens, as well as small outdoor chapels to celebrate Mass. The great Holy Land scholar Murphy O'Connor speaks about the view from the mount. From here, one can see virtually all the places in which Jesus lived and worked. Capernaum, located on the northwest coast of the Sea of Galilee. This was the hometown of Peter and his brother Andrew, James, John, and Matthew the tax collector. It also became the center of Jesus' ministry. Not far from the gates of this most famous pilgrimage destination is the traditional home of Peter, now protected by an ultra-modern church elevated by eight pillars. Inside the church, one can look down on the original excavated home of Peter and his family, a dwelling where Jesus would have spent a great deal of time. Biblical scholars believe that Jesus would have cured Peter's mother-in-law in this home, and where he cured the paralytic who was lowered from the ceiling. The Bible says that when people knew Jesus was in town, they would bring him their poor, their sick, and the possessed to be healed. As centuries passed, many more churches would be built around this holy site. Only a few hundred feet away is one of the best preserved synagogues whose foundation dates back to the second century. And underneath that, more foundations that are most likely the synagogue that Jesus would have known during his lifetime. All around the synagogue there lay the ruins of small houses of the people, mostly fishermen who would have lived in Capernaum. Because it was a poor fishing village right on the shores of the Sea of Galilee, we get a sense of how small and how simple these houses were. They would have been people who suffered tremendously under the Roman occupation and heard Jesus' message with great enthusiasm. They would become his first disciples and followers. The Gospels tell us that the miracle of the multiplication of the loaves and fishes happened in a remote place on the shores of Galilee. When it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, This is a lonely place, and the day is now over. Send the crowds away to go into the villages and buy food for themselves. Jesus said, They need not go away. You give them something to eat. They said to him, We have only five loaves here and two fish. And he said, bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass, and taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven, and blessed, and broke, and gave the loaves to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the crowds. And they all ate and were satisfied, and they took up twelve baskets full of the broken pieces left over. And those who ate were about five thousand men, besides women and children. Matthew 14, verses 15 to 21. The church, which bears the name of the miracle, is located on the northwestern shore of Galilee in Tabka. Since the times of the early church, there have been monasteries and churches built on this site, the most recent, a 20th century church run by the German Benedictine order. Ancient fragments of a Byzantine monastery are evident in a beautiful mosaic of the loaves and the fishes directly in front of the altar. Under the altar is a block of limestone venerated as the table of the Lord, the spot where he fed the 5,000 with only five loaves and two fishes. St. Mother Teresa reminds us that God can do much with little. Beside the church of St. Anne in Jerusalem is the Bethesda pool, whose waters were believed to have a curative power. People came there in large numbers in hopes of being healed. There was a Jewish tradition that at certain times of the day, an angel would come and stir up the water, and that the first person to be plunged into the water would be healed. The Bible tells us that Jesus came to a person who had been lame throughout his life and had no one to lower him into the water. Jesus cured him on the spot. This is a place we can say for certain that Jesus came to and performed a miraculous healing. 
It is one of the places in Jerusalem that we can concretely relate to the Gospels and to the ministry of Jesus. Recent excavations in the City of David area of Jerusalem have uncovered what may be the very pool where Jesus performed the miracle of curing a man blind from birth. As he said this, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle and anointed the man's eyes with the clay, saying to him, Go and wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. John 9, verses 6 and 7. With its stone incline dating back to the time of Christ, we can say for certain that Jesus would have walked these very steps. In the ancient city of Magdala, on the shores of the Sea of Galilee, Duke in Altum is considered one of the most unique spiritual centers in the Holy Land. The name references the words of Jesus put out into deep water, preached from the pulpit of Peter's fishing boat. These words would result in a miraculous catch and a new calling for the apostles to become fishers of men. As he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Matthew 4, verses 18 and 19. Just through the doors of this ultra-modern site is the women's atrium, honoring the women of the Bible. Magdala is the hometown of Mary Magdalene, one of the many women who supported Jesus with their own means. Surrounding the women's atrium are four mosaic chapels, illustrating events from the public life of Jesus. Jesus walking on water while saving Peter from drowning. Christ calling his apostles on the shores of the Sea of Galilee. Mary Magdalene, the first to see the resurrected Christ. And the daughter of Jairus, the only woman whom Jesus raised from the dead. On the lower level, pilgrims can visit the Encounter Chapel, honoring the miraculous encounter between Jesus and the hemorrhaging woman, who touched his cloak and was healed instantly. The chapel features a first-century floor of Magdala. Seven kilometers east of Nazareth is majestic Mount Tabor, the traditional site of the transfiguration of Jesus. In the Old Testament, we hear of Tabor as the sacred mountain and place of worship. Early pilgrims used to climb 4,300 steps cut into the rocky slope to reach the summit. Today, taxis and shuttles navigate hairpin turns to make the spectacular summit of Tabor. The Church of the Transfiguration, built in 1924, was erected on the ruins of earlier churches. It features three distinct peaks, one for Christ, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Its entrance is flanked by chapels dedicated to these great prophets who were seen with Jesus during his transfiguration. Moses holding the Ten Commandments on tablet, and Elijah, whose faith is affirmed when his offering is consumed by the one true God. Above the main altar on the dome ceiling is a glorious mosaic depiction of the event. An altar and fragments of walls of a Byzantine church can be found in the crypt under the church. There is a tradition that the rock floor of the crypt is where Jesus stood during the Transfiguration. Over the tomb of David on Mount Zion in Jerusalem is a second-story room commemorating the place where Jesus shared the Last Supper with his disciples. Built in the 12th century, historians believe the room was built over or very near the original site of the Last Supper and Pentecost. 
Now as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you that I shall not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Matthew 26, verses 26 to 30. Once robust with thousands of olive trees, the Mount of Olives provides a breathtaking view of the Kidron Valley and the Old City. As he did throughout his ministry, Jesus came to the Mount of Olives to pray and spend some time with his disciples. But this time would be his last. Just a few days earlier, Jesus went down this mount on his triumphant entry into Jerusalem, our Palm Sunday, through the Golden Gate, or Gate of Mercy, which was sealed shut by the Ottomans in 1541. According to Jewish tradition, the Shekinah, or Divine Presence, used to appear through the Eastern Gate and will appear again when the Anointed One, or Messiah, comes. Ezekiel 44, verses 1 to 3. It is for this reason that the Mount of Olives is the location of thousands of tombs and is the most ancient cemetery in the Holy Land. For the Jewish people, their belief is that the resurrection of the dead will begin on the Mount of Olives. While the Mount of Olives is a place that speaks of death, it is also a place that speaks of hope and the biblical promise of new life and resurrection. At least twice on the night before he was crucified, Jesus would have walked through the Kidron Valley on Passover night when he would have seen these tombs very clearly. It is likely he would have reflected on his own impending passion and death, but also God's promise to raise up his people to new life at the end of time which he knew he had come to inaugurate. The Mount of Olives is a very fitting backdrop for some of the key events of the Passion. About halfway down the slope of the Mount of Olives is a sanctuary built in the shape of a teardrop, Dominus Flevit, Latin for the Lord wept. The Gospels say that as Jesus came over the crest of the hill, he saw Jerusalem before him for the last time. He wept over it because it had not recognized the moment of its visitation. Although this site has been venerated from the time of the Crusades, the current church was built in the 1950s. During construction of the sanctuary, archaeologists uncovered artifacts dating back to the Canaanite period, as well as tombs from the Second Temple in Byzantine eras. Inside, the window behind the altar gives a clear view of the Temple Mount and the old city of Jerusalem. Jesus would have viewed a similar vista and wept over its coming destruction. O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, killing the prophets and stoning those who were sent to you. Matthew 23, verse 37. In the church, you can see a beautiful mosaic of a mother hen, referencing the passage where Jesus longed to gather the children of Jerusalem as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, but they did not accept him. Near the base of the Mount of Olives is the Garden of Gethsemane, where Jesus went with his disciples to pray before he entered his Passion. Behind the iron fence, pilgrims can walk through 1,200 square meters of garden adorning eight ancient olive trees. There are some botanists who say that some of the trees could be 2,000 years old and could have very well witnessed the events of the agony. 
Adjacent to the garden is the Church of All Nations, also known as the Basilica of the Agony, built in 1924. At the peak of the church facade stands two stags on either side of the cross. Below, towering statues of the evangelists are seen on the massive church pillars. In the heart of that church is the rough-hewn rock where tradition says Jesus prayed on Holy Thursday. Christ sweat great drops of blood as he prayed for God's guidance and strength before his passion. It was also in that same area where Jesus was arrested by the temple guards and led by Judas Iscariot, the traitor. From Jesus' arrest on the Mount of Olives, we move inside the old city Jerusalem to the Via Della Rosa, or Way of Sorrows, where Jesus' passion, death, and resurrection are marked by 14 stations. Scholars agree this is unlikely the actual route of Jesus' path to Calvary. However, this traditional walk has been traveled for centuries. While each station is identified by Roman numeral markers on the walls and doors, the hustle and bustle of present-day shops and markets nearby make a pilgrimage guide almost imperative. In all this busyness, one realizes that just like in the time of Christ, he still needs to be sought out with our whole hearts. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Behold the man, John 19, verse 5. Between stations 2 and 3, one can see the Ecce Homo Arch, which reaches across the Via Della Rosa. The Latin phrase recalls the words of Pontius Pilate, Behold the man. Not far from the arch is the Ecce Homo Pilgrim House, owned by the congregation of Notre Dame de Sion. In the lower level, pilgrims find the traditional site of the stone pavement, once claimed as the place of Pilate's judgment seat. Pilgrims can see the Lithostratos, or Roman paving, considered to be where Jesus suffered at the hands of the Roman soldiers and where the trial by Pontius Pilate took place. Markings on the stones denote the king's game, believed to have been the place where Jesus was mocked by Roman soldiers who rolled dice for his clothing. Next to the Franciscan Study Center of the Custody of the Holy Land are two chapels commemorating the flagellation and condemnation of Christ. Tradition tells us that this is the site where Jesus was flogged by Roman soldiers after he was condemned to death. A small chapel at the third station depicts Jesus falling for the first time. At station number four, we recall the sorrowful meeting between Jesus and our Blessed Mother. A small Franciscan church established in 1229 marks the fifth station where Simon the Cyrenian assisted Jesus with the cross. And as they led him away, they seized one Simon of Cyrene who was coming in from the country and laid on him the cross to carry it behind Jesus. Luke 23, verse 26. The Via Della Rosa continues to commemorate Veronica wiping the face of Jesus, the second and third fall of Christ, and the consolation of the women of Jerusalem. But Jesus turning to them said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. Luke 23, verse 28. The remaining stations of the cross are located further down the Via Della Rosa at one of the very first churches built by Emperor Constantine, which still stands today.
The Church of the Holy Sepulchre is a massive structure, nearly hidden from plain sight, yet holds the very places where the greatest miracles in the history of the world took place, the crucifixion and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. The outside courtyard marks the place where Christ was stripped of his garments. Entrance to a small chapel, the Chapel of the Franks, is seen here. Enter the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, where just inside and up the stairs is Golgotha, now a Greek Orthodox altar, where scholars mark the location of Christ's crucifixion and death on the cross. Underneath the altar, pilgrims can kiss the spot where the Holy Cross of Christ stood. To the right of the altar is a statue of Mary, Our Lady of Sorrows, commemorating her sharing in Christ's passion, and another altar belonging to the Catholic Church, where Mass is celebrated under a breathtaking mosaic of Our Lady and Christ crucified. Back on the ground floor, near the entrance to the church, there is a small Armenian shrine dedicated to the holy women who kept watch during Christ's crucifixion and death. Directly beneath Calvary in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre is the Chapel of Adam, where one can see a crack in the rock of Golgotha, significant because the Bible speaks of an earthquake at the time of the crucifixion. Adam, the first man, is thought to have been buried here, and when the rock split, blood fell upon his remains and redeemed him and all of mankind. Nicodemus also, who had at first come to him by night, came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pounds weight. John 19, verse 39. At the entryway is the stone of anointing, where Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea prepared our Lord for his burial. Behind the stone is a beautiful mosaic depicting the anointing in great detail. The stone, touching holy objects to its surface, even clinging to it, desiring a closeness to our dear Savior. And he bought a linen shroud, and taking him down, wrapped him in the linen shroud, and laid him in a tomb, which had been hewn out of the rock. And he rolled a stone against the door of the tomb. Mark 15, verse 46. Not far from Golgotha, and also within the building of the modern church, is the edicule, or little house, the site of the tomb of Jesus. A building within a building shelters what remains of the original tomb which temporarily held the body of our Lord. Centuries of structures have covered this most sacred place which pilgrims will wait as long as it takes to spend but a moment inside the edicule where Christ rose from the dead. A small chamber called the Chapel of the Angel marks the spot where the women who came on Easter Sunday were greeted by the angel with the news that Jesus had risen from the dead. Just beyond is a very small chapel with a marble slab covering the remains of the ledge where the body of Jesus would have been laid on Good Friday after it had been prepared for burial. For Christians, this is the most sacred place in all the world where death was conquered and the resurrection revealed and all the promises of Jesus came to fruition. tells us that Jesus would appear to his followers many times after his resurrection, including the upper room, on the road to Emmaus, and by the Sea of Galilee. The Church of the Primacy of Peter stands on the tranquil shores of Tabca, on the Sea of Galilee. It is on these shores that the resurrected Christ appeared to the apostles, although they did not recognize him. After a night of catching nothing, Jesus tells the fishermen disciples to cast their net on the right side of the boat. They could hardly contain the catch. Scripture tells us that Christ cooked them breakfast on the shore. Inside the church, pilgrims can see and touch a large rock built into the floor. This is the traditional place where Jesus prepared breakfast, Mensa Christi, or the table of the Lord. 
At that same breakfast, Peter would come to terms with his three denials. As Jesus asked him three times, Peter, son of John, do you love me more than these others? It was after this that Jesus again commissioned him to become chief shepherd of the church. Scholars believe that early Christians venerated the ascension of our Lord in a remote cave on the Mount of Olives, most likely for safety reasons. While the actual location of the ascension of Jesus is unknown, there is a small chapel atop the Mount of Olives which dates to Jesus before he ascended into heaven. Then he led them out as far as Bethany, and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. While he blessed them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. And they returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple blessing God. Luke 24, verses 50 to 53. This fortress-like building on the hill of Mount Zion in Jerusalem is home to the Church of the Dormition, or the falling asleep of the Virgin Mary. In 1950, when Pope Pius XII declared the Assumption of Mary to be a dogma of the faith, he said that at the end of Mary's earthly life, she was taken up into heaven. While there is no mention of Mary dying in the official teachings, the church speaks of her as simply falling asleep. She, the sinless one, the mother of the Messiah, would not be subject to the law of death. Rather, her spirit was taken up, body and soul, into heaven. The dome of the church is a magnificent Byzantine icon of Jesus and Mary as mother of God. The church has a number of side altars reflecting how Mary is understood in various different cultures and countries. A magnificent mosaic floor that includes the names of all the 12 apostles, the 12 months of the year, and the seasons of the zodiac to show that Jesus is the center of all time and should be the center of our lives. Her immaculate body was placed here in this renowned and all-glorious tomb from whence after three days it was taken up into the heavenly mansion, St. John Damascene. In the lower level of the church, pilgrims can visit the crypt and venerate a beautiful ivory and cherry wood statue which depicts the Virgin Mary asleep, awaiting her glorious assumption into heaven where she would meet her son again. And this is our hope as Christians, that we will one day meet our Lord and Savior, and he will say to us, Well done, my good and faithful servant. But until that time, we have the great gift of the earthly pilgrimage to the Holy Land, the awesome experience of walking the streets that Jesus and his disciples walked, visiting the sites of his miracles, and venerating the relics and icons of his passion, death, and resurrection.